Is it worth to be pursued? And if so, which purpose should we pursue? Is there an objective purpose? These are the questions we will talk about tonight. Welcome to this forum. If you have questions during the forum, we would like you to Twitter or a text it. The will be on the, on the Beamer. Um, so we can uh, collect them during the forum and then t during the Q&A uh, we will use these questions. Um, after the forum there will be a social drink, so all uh, be welcome to that. And then with fur without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers to you. First is uh, John Lennox, professor in the mathematics on the Oxford University, internationally internationally renowned speaker on the interface of science, philosophy and religion. He teaches at many academic institutions and has, writ has written books on the relationships between science and Christianity. He debated leading athe atheist thinkers like Richard Dawkins, Lawrence Cross and Christopher Hitches. Hans Harbers will critically interview John Lennox and he is an associate professor of philosophy of science, sociology, technology and society at the University of Groningen. He's a freelance moderator of uh, debates and uh, speeches and he is a down-to-earth philosopher uh, with a critical perspective. We will start this evening with a speech by John Lennox. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, for your invitation to this distinguished university. I'm delighted to be here and I'm more than delighted to have the opportunity to discuss with Dr. Harbers. We've already discovered we've got a common friend in the sociology of science. Now I've been asked to talk to you about purpose in an uncertain world. And of course, when you ask someone about purpose, there are two ways you can handle it. You can handle it purely intellectually and philosophically. Or you can handle it personally, or you can try to mix them. And I'm going to try to mix them a bit tonight, because I come to you in a sense as unknown. And my main contributions, if they're worth anything on purpose, of course reflect my own experience. And you need to know a little bit about that in order to see exactly where I am coming from. Well, I'm coming from Northern Ireland. And that is a story on its own, of course. It's not exactly the best advert for Christianity at all times. My parents were very unusual. They were Christian without being sectarian. And they allowed me to think. Indeed, they encouraged me to think. So my first engagement with the Christian worldview as a child was something that was intellectually invigorating, expansive, knew no limits of exploration. And it was only until much later that I discovered that there were some people professing Christians who didn't regard the world like that. My father, I remember when I was 14, handed me the Communist Manifesto and said, you ought to read this. You ought to know what Marx is saying. So that's the atmosphere I grew up in. And when I went to Cambridge last century, I... <laughs> yes, it's true, actually. Um, I encountered in my first week something that actually set a compass bearing in my life in terms of its purpose. I went up to read mathematics. Why did I do that? Why did I seek the purpose in doing maths? Well, actually, I wanted to do languages. And then I wanted to do electrical engineering. And then somebody said, well, you might get into Cambridge if you did maths. So I did maths. So the way in which our life's purposes are set often seem to be a little bit arbitrary retrospectively. And when I got there, as I say, in my first week, a student said to me, do you believe in God? And then he said, oh, I'm so sorry I asked you that. You're Irish. <laughs> All you Irish believe in God, and you fight about it. Now, I'd heard that before, but somehow I felt this is an important stage in life. 
I've been brought up with parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents who had absorbed and lived the Christian worldview. Now I was at Cambridge. And now I had a unique opportunity of pursuing what I think is the most important question relating to purpose, and that is a question of truth. I wasn't interested in whether my Christianity was merely helpful. I wanted to know how it set within the field of worldviews, and so I decided to get to know them, not simply theoretically through reading books, but personally through getting to know people who did not share my background, who'd never been to church, and so on and so forth. And I've been doing it ever since, befriending people of alternative worldviews. I got so interested in this, running through Cambridge, I did mathematics, but I was always interested in where does mathematics sit within science? And where does science fit in within the bigger meta-narrative? Is there a bigger meta-narrative? And in any case, many people said, you shouldn't believe in God because you're from Northern Ireland, and secondly, you shouldn't believe in God because you're a mathematician. And so the whole question of whether science sat neutrally in the worldview scene, or pointed towards atheism, as Richard Dawkins would suggest, or pointed towards my own theistic Christian faith, as I would suggest, those were questions in their infancy. And as I began to think about them, I was beginning to discover an overarching purpose for my life. In a sense, it was a quest to answer the big questions, the worldview questions, the questions that shape our lives and we think about in school, university, and later on. What is the meaning of life? Is there a purpose? Is there objective reality? What is ultimate reality? Is death the end? Is there a future? And that latter is important. Because, of course, purpose means that you're talking about the future by definition. You don't purpose to do what you're doing now. You are all people of purpose. Look at you sitting here. When did you decide to come? Well, before you came, obviously. No one actually logically can live in the present. You live, sorry, for the present. You live in the present. But you live for a future. And it was early on very clear to me that I wanted to research the parameters that define the future, get it into the biggest possible scope, so that I could relate all the various aspects of my life to it. So I see purposes as of different sizes, limited purposes. I find myself to be an animal that likes to eat. And so tonight I had a lovely meal before coming here. And that purpose satisfied me aesthetically. It was beautifully arranged. So it satisfied another aspect of my person. I find myself to be an aesthetic being. But of course, there are longer term purposes. You've probably got a three year one or a four year one sitting here, haven't you? To get your degree at the end and nobly to defeat the examiners in this university. And then you'll have another purpose to get a career, to get a job. And then maybe you'll want to buy a house and a car and a yacht and you'll need money for that and so on. And maybe in the end, you will have children. And then you want to send them to school. To do what? To get to Groningen University. To do what? To get a degree. To do what? Well, to be able to get a good job and get a house. And, and the ancient Greeks were interested in this. The cycle seems to go round. And they started to ask themselves, was there such a thing as a summum bonum? That is something that you aimed at that was simply not merely a means to another end, like getting a degree, to get a job, to get a house, to get money. Is there something overarching? Now, not that there's anything wrong with these purposes. They're very important. And so we have to distinguish between them, and therefore we will find that there's a broad swathe of purposes over which we can agree. Food, for instance the satisfaction of the basic physical needs that we find ourselves as humans capable of. But then things begin to differ at the higher level of the meta-narrative. What is the big picture, or is there one, into which my life's purposes can be fitted? Let me put it this way. 
The ancient Greeks were brilliant. I love reading their stuff. They, they asked big questions. What is this made of? And then they thought, well, that's not a big enough question. What's it made for? And Aristotle, of course, was interested in four aspects of this, but I'm only going to think of two. What's it made of? And suppose one morning you woke up and outside your flat or your dorm, there was a beautiful Jeep sitting, brand new. And there were keys in it. And there it sits. And it sits for two or three days until you get curious and get in and drive it around. Nobody stops you. And then you start to ask questions. Science can tell you what it's made of. And in a sense you know what it's made for, but was it made for you? Can you drive it where you want? Did it come from a donor or did it just appear by magic? And you'll ask all kinds of questions about it. And it's interesting, you know, because in, in the end, we find ourselves equipped with a magnificent piece of physical and biological engineering. And if we don't accede to the thesis that we are our brains, then we've got minds. And here I am, sitting inside this infinitely exquisite and complex human body with all its facilities. I can study what it's made of, but what's it made for? Is it made for anything? Now that, to my mind, is a very important question to ask. And you see, it's here. Again, I've got to be personal because I want to share with you the things that I feel answered my questions gradually and still do. I might tell you that I was so interested in alternative worldviews that I learned German so that I could mix freely in the German Democratic Republic during the Cold War. I then learned Russian to do the same thing in the Russian Academy of Sciences. Interested in seeing what atheism does as a meta-narrative to a society. So, what happened in Cambridge in those early days has driven me for all of my life. And it has actually been a very large part of my overarching purpose. But there have been lesser purposes, of course. I'm married, I've got three children, seven grandchildren, I've got a home, I, I'm interested in mathematics, I've found purpose in that. But the big question, the overarching purpose, was that in the end I came back to a very old story which fascinates me. When you ask what is life in the sense of what makes life life, there's a story in the first book of the Bible that talks about this. I'm not going to tonight discuss the level of its literature, that's another matter. But its content, the questions it raises, it talks about the fact that human beings have first of all a material base. The way it's put there is God made human beings of the dust of the ground. There's so and so much material. But there's more than that. God made the trees to grow, pleasant to the sight and good for food. That's a very important part of life's purpose for many people. Food, as you can see from the geometry of some people, forms a very large part of purpose. But leaving that aside, we usually impose an ascetic discipline because we find we are creatures capable of recognizing and admiring beauty. That for many people, let's leave aside those for whom eating is the major purpose in life, and let's think of people for whom aesthetics is the purpose in life. Collecting a wonderful collection of paintings, getting the latest Picasso or the Fabergé egg or something like this. That fills many people's horizons. And what I began to study as I read, what I began to think realized as I read this ancient narrative was that the Bible actually says more than most philosophies, not less. Hedonism has us going after pleasure and the satisfaction of our aesthetic sense. But there's more here. We're told a river flowed out of the Garden of Eden. And it divided and it became four rivers. And if you follow them down, you find gold. What's all that about? Well, it's simple language, ladies and gentlemen, but don't miss its profundity. It's raising the question of human curiosity, surely. When I see a river or a railway line, I always ask, where is it going? Well, if you follow it, you'll discover that there's minerals there, and actually you can develop them. 
that forms a large part of many of my colleagues' lives' purpose in Oxford. Following the rivers. Following the streams of imagination and doing research. That's fascinating stuff. Is that all there is to life? No, there's much more. Because we're told that human beings were put by God into a garden to look after it. They were given work. Work is part of life. And many people find it fulfills all they feel they need for purpose. So what we've got, a material base, food, aesthetics, curiosity and research, work. Is there anything more to that? Yes. There's relationship. God created man and woman. And what else is there? Well, there's another thing in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Human beings are moral beings. And now comes the interesting thing. Their morality is determined vertically first. Their relationship with God. So when I'm asked about purpose, you see, this paradigm is in my mind. Because I believe it to be true. And we will have the opportunity later, I'm sure, I'm going to be grilled. In fact, I'm going to be dragged according to this missive into some kind of maelstrom of questions, and I look forward to it. But it's important that I set out in front of you what I believe to be the case, that human beings are made for something. And there are all kinds of limited things which we can share, but the overarching meta-narrative is we're made for the glory of an infinite creator who has dignified us was something utterly unique. He has made us in his own image. That is, of course, the foundation of Western morality and the dignity of man. Made in the image of God. He's a creator. We are creative. And I'm sure many of you are in literature, the arts and musicology, mathematics and all the other sciences. And in that ancient book, you get the mandate to do science. God says, go and name the animals. Taxonomy is the foundation discipline of every academic subject. You know words I don't know. I know words you don't know. That's true, isn't it? And so it's so interesting to see that the mandate for doing that comes from the Bible. Now the final point. And this raises the big issues. What about the future? Now here the worldviews divide. Materialism tells me that eventually the matter of my body will disappear and I will cease to be. I believe that there is a supernatural God who because he raised Christ from the dead will eventually raise me. And therefore my future, my purposes in this life don't come to an end with my death but they flow on into a wonderful and unimaginably wonderful future. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Can you understand me? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Well, you're very generous, Hans. Thank you. We say John and Hans. Yes, please do, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maybe... Uh, it is a good thing that you gave your birth papers starting this. Yes, uh, really? Why? I, I give mine very short. Okay, do that, uh, please. So you can understand how, from, from which history I ask my questions. That would be great. Thank I you. was born in a Christian family as well. Okay. Orthodox Christian family in the Netherlands, in the country. Then I started doubting uh, belief in when I was about 16, 17 years old. Then I came to this city as a student in the 60s, the student revolt, the time of the Marxism. I was pulled in a Marxist worldview. And after a time I thought, I switched from the one worldview, the one dogmatic worldview to another dogmatic worldview. And it's both, both dogmatic. And they are completely opposite dogmas, but both dogmatic. And that's the problem. And then I started to fight dogmatism as such, and I became a pragmatist. 
So maybe that's, that's my basic point for the questions. Pragmatism, which denies every dogmatism. Dogmatism is contrary to democratic, free deliberation, a conversation so you're as a, we have now. So you're a dogmatic anti-dogmatist. That's it. <laughs> Good, I've got it. <laughs> <clears throat> we'll go into that. Uh, <laughs> I think you might. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah, okay, that's you just, carry on. That's just uh, uh, the realist say to the relativist, you, you cut uh, the tree you are sitting on. Yes, yes. That depends on which side you cut it. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. When you do it to your left and the tree is there, you don't fall down. Uh, but let me start with a question about... You, you, you connect purpose and truth. I do, yes. Yes. Uh, and then you say the truth, the, you, you connect all kinds of other words, meta-narrative, overarching uh, uh, purpose, the big picture. You are not satisfied by the purpose of being happy married with your wife and having children and seven uh, oh, grandchildren. I'm, I'm extremely happy with it. Yeah, but it's not enough. No, it's not enough. Why it's not enough? Well, I thought you would know the answer to that. Uh, you're a philosopher. Um, I, I think because okay. we are multidimensional beings, I, I find that question actually quite strange. Because we're sitting in a university bursting with young life and interested in everything. So picking one aspect out of humanity, like family life, and to say that's everything, it's not enough. But let me give you the underlying reason why it's not enough. Uh, was it Augustine who said that um, we are restless, God has made us for himself, and we are restless until we find our rest in him? It's because we're made in the image of God that we find it's not enough. We have been created with an immense dignity and immense capacities, and that's why we get restless, I suspect. But now you give an answer. What would be your take on that? You give an answer in terms of God. Uh, yes, I have, yeah. indeed. But as soon as I don't accept that answer, then still there could be other possibilities of over, overarching ideas. Well, go ahead. And I would, it, it's not the family. I, the, the, I only ask why you need an overarching idea. Well, I mean, if you want to be and pragmatic... You, and the, when you answer it in terms of God, then it's a circular uh, uh, answer. I don't think it is, but I was trying to answer it at a higher level. Let me be pragmatic now. Why is a family not enough? Because you've got to feed them, so you'll have to work to feed them. So that brings you into the realm of work. Yes. So you'll have to go outside the family. Yes. So what do you work at? Well, maybe it's science in my case. So you can find legitimizing things, but... You're right, I do fit them into the bigger meta-narrative because I believe transcendence in the end is what brings everything together. But I will admit there are lesser things, of yeah. course. I, I think there, there is our difference. You bring in the word transcendence. Yes. Why not, uh, starting from the family, indeed, you go to work, you have food, etc. You still stay imminent. And, of course, you push the boundary of your imminent world. It becomes bigger and bigger, and you are more connected, and we are globalized already, etc. But why we need a transcendental point? Either God, or a scientific worldview, or a materialistic worldview, I fully agree with that. These are all, in my terms, the same transcendental ways of thinking. Well, what I would say, I think, there is, strictly speaking, you are an example of someone who says, I don't need a transcendental point. So I answer your question saying, well, you don't need a transcendental point. But my question is, is there a transcendental point? And I've come to the conclusion that there's evidence that this is true. So to shut out of my worldview something I believe is vastly important and true would be to narrow the field utterly unnecessarily. So it's a question for me, as in my science, of where does the evidence point? Because after all, you're right, 
there are these two diametrically worldviews that we've raised. One is materialism, if you like, or naturalism, if you want to distinguish mm -hmm. between those two. And the other, in my case, is Christian theism. They do oppose each other. But now, do we have any indicators in the universe as to which of them, if either, is true? And I believe we do. So that's where I go from. It's not a question of need. It's, it, it is a question of truth. I've, I've always been driven by this, whether rightly or wrongly. But that's interesting. Your opposition between, and I saw it in, in a lot of other lectures you gave, uh, uh, on the one hand, reductionism, materialism, scientism, whatever you want to call it. Ah, but I would make distinctions here. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, there's good reductionism, but, but, then, I, but and, there's and, bad reductionism. And then the other side, you put theism. But what about... Humanism, what about holism, what about constructivism, what about idealism? These are all philosophical positions who also contest your enemy, materialism, uh, uh, materialistic yes, scientific worldview. Yes, I agree with that. I agree but they with all that. do it without a notion of God. Do I need a notion of God to attack the, the fundamentalism of the scientists? of the Dawkins? I think probably not necessarily, but you're, you're interested in need. Uh, I mean, I'm delighted when constructivists and holists and everything else, and by the way, I think there's a lot of truth in those positions. I'm not, I, I'm not saying they're mutually exclusive, because as a Christian, I want to take a very holistic view. Mine includes God, and that's, that's even more than the holism that doesn't include God, if you mm -hmm. see what I mean. And um, so, Coming to that kind of question, I'm very interested in your use of the word need, 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 rather than talking about what is so. Uh, would you explain to me as a philosopher how, uh, why need is so important to you in this questioning? Yeah, that's, that's the traditional Occam's razor. You should not uh, use more words than necessary. And I can uh, contest the materialistic worldview without introducing a notion of God on, based on a humanist worldview. Et I completely agree when you, when you attack the position that we people are not any more than our brains. Of course, there is a lot of discussion, but you can discuss that without the notion of God. Ah. I think I understand you now. Is what you're saying, Hans, that um, God seems to go one step too far in a sense. He's explanatorily unnecessary. Is, is that what you're saying? And therefore we should uh, use the minimum of hypotheses according to Occam and reduce them by one. Well, I think God is an explanatory necessity, particularly yeah. for the fact that we can do science. Because I, I do think that the only alternative is the kind of um, uh, reductionism that we're facing that reduces thought to meaninglessness. And I also think, and this is highly provocative, this is Dostoevsky though, um, that at the moral level, I don't think we can solve Hume's problem of going from is to ought without God. And I don't think we can solve the problem of going from is to rationality, just atoms and molecules in motion, to go to rationality. In other words, what I'm saying is the God hypothesis, if we regard it as a hypothesis, has tremendous explanatory power. And one of the things that drew my attention, if I just go on for one second on this to show where I'm coming from, is when I discovered that modern science arguably owes its rise to belief in God. Newton, Kepler, Clark Maxwell, Galileo all believed in God, and the general thesis around um, that's widely accepted by the people that I've consulted anyway is, to put it in the words of C.S. Lewis, uh, men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. And that has made sense of my science. It was the motor that drove it. So. That but, shows. But this was 17th century. Yes. 17th century doesn't force me to, to think the same as the scientist. Do you mean because everybody believed in God then? In that time, reading the book of nature was reading the book of God. 
And in that sense, there indeed, when you, the, the, there was the purpose of reading the book of nature is also reading the book of God. That was for the glory of God. But that was 17th century. I yeah. can read the book of nature for completely other purposes. Yeah, but half a moment. That's 17th century Europe. It's not 17th century China. And, and the whole point of that is, I think I need to come around the other side to sort of pair that off, because I've been very interested in, in Joseph Needham, who was a brilliant chemist and a sinologist and a neo-Marxist, as you know. And for years, he tried to account for the lack of the rise of abstract science, that's modern science, not ancient science, but modern science, in the Chinese culture. They had technology, they had printing, they had fireworks and all kinds of things, but no abstract science. And Needham came to the conclusion that he could see that the main difference was this, the Chinese lacked the unifying concept of a creator who'd created the universe running on fixed laws. So if you argue that was the 17th century, I will agree, and they all believed in God in Europe, but they didn't in China. So I think you can come at this both ways and make a decent yes. case. But I, I can completely agree, uh, agree the idea, this explanation of Needham, which followed up uh, the studies of religion and science by Max Weber, and rationalization, mm -hmm. etc. But the fact that a notion of God was functional for uh, the scientific revolution in, in Europe is not an argument for God. It was well, functional. It's, it's certainly not it, an argument it, against him. It's no. certainly not an argument no, against not, him. But I didn't say that. No, but it's not neutral. There, there's a convergence, and it seems to me that... Uh, I feel it is, a, it is a plausibility argument for the existence of God. After all, you know, we measure truth in different ways, although it's hard to define. Uh, and one thing is the, the, its coherence. And it seems to me this is an explanation that coheres. The explanation that there is no God doesn't cohere. No, my but mind. I didn't say that, that there isn't a God. I think... I, I will defend there is a God. No, just, well, good stuff. Go ahead. I'll be, very, <laughs> I'll be very happy to listen to that. There is, there is a God just the, as there is a Santa Claus. Oh, I, I believe in Santa Claus. And we all do. Since well, on 5 December, we all buy uh, little things for our children. And we reproduce in our actions the existence of Santa Claus. And in that sense, the existence of God is daily reproduced. When I had to hire in Groningen an apartment, uh, it was for, from a, a Christian company who rents uh, apartments, I had to sign a contract that I uh, was not allowed to hang my laundry on the balcony on Sunday. I had to sign that contract. And of course, that's that rule in that contract that has basically behind that is a God idea. Really? And at the moment I signed that, <laughs> yes, at the moment I signed that, I reproduced the existence of God. I did it myself. Well, and in that sense, God really exists. And was that a question? Well, no, let, let me come to it. You, you wanted to hear let, my well, defense of the existence okay, of God. Let I go to Here you the have audience. It. Did we steal Santa Claus from you? We probably did. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when I was young, I believed in Santa Claus. And then I discovered that Santa Claus was my parents. But then I hesitated. Because I discovered there's a material advantage in keeping up this public expression of belief in Santa Claus. <laughs> now, let me put it to the audience. He says God is like Santa Claus. I think not, ladies and gentlemen. Have you ever met an adult who came to believe in Santa Claus? I've met thousands of adults who've come to believe in God. So I don't think he's in the same category at all. But don't you make then the traditional distinction which in the, is in the science-religion debate between cognition on the one hand, it's real, it's existence, and belief on the other hand. Ah. And uh, I would say that's the wrong distinction. Well, I would too, because it's a misuse of the word belief. And I think one of the big problems that bedevils the whole discussion, 
and not from your perspective, I'm speaking generally now, is that the so-called new atheists, whom I have tangled with from time to time, as you know, have been very clever in redefining faith and belief as A, a religious term, and B, it means believing where there's no evidence. I think both are dangerously in error. Faith, fides, from the Latin, we trust people because we've evidence. We discovered that during the financial crisis. I don't think there's a person in the Western world who doesn't understand what evidence-based faith is. And the big delusion that has been perpetrated by the author of the God delusion I think he's deluded about the nature of faith because he thinks when he meets someone like me, I'm a man of faith, which is an insult actually because it means I believe that there's no evidence. I wouldn't sit here for a moment if I didn't think that the Christian faith was evidence-based. Now the other thing is this, that science involves faith and that gets parameterized out by this redefinition. And Einstein, of course, was a very bright person, as I think we'll both agree. Einstein said he could not imagine a scientist without that faith. Faith in what? Not in God, of course. But he meant faith in the rational intelligibility of the universe. I was taught quantum physics at Cambridge by John Polkinghorne. He used to say this, and it stuck in my mind. He said, physics is powerless to explain its faith in the rational intelligibility of the universe for the simple reason that you've got to believe in the rational intelligibility of the universe before you can do any physics. And that leads you down to the next level, which I can go into if you want to, is why would you believe in the rational intelligibility of the universe? And for me, that fits exactly. There's a God-shaped section in there that comes to play. But Santa Claus... And Freudian explanations don't wash with me, Hans, to be honest, because uh, I'm sure you come across Manfred Lutz. But you say Freudian explanations. It's not, why it is a Freudian explanation? It's, it, it's a pragmatic a wish explanation. Wish fulfillment. That, what do you mean by existence? For me, existence is what, we, what makes us do something. Is that existence or motivation? Existence. Santa Claus makes us do something. Well, it's, it's not an existence outside us. That's that's well, my anti-transcendental point again. It's an existence of an idea. Of course it is. But to place God in the same realm as Santa Claus, the point I made was you can't do that actually, because there's evidence for the existence of uh, an intelligent God, whereas there's no evidence for the independent existence of a Santa Claus beyond the figment of a person's imagination, unless, of course, there's something to the legends and the stories of an actual person called St. Nicholas who did certain things, but that's not what children are encouraged to believe now. Yeah, but then you make again this <laughs> distinction between facts and fiction. What is real and what is imagination. Yes, I want to make a distinction. And yes. I just, my pragmatist epistemology is just beyond that. That I say, the, there, is, there are no given facts outside the world, naturalism, realism, and there are not only fictions which we make up and we can change. No, the fiction of Santa Claus is a very realistic fiction. Okay. And in that sense, I, th I would think that just the notion as, of fiction is just as wrong as the notion of a hard fact outside out, our thinking. Well, let me put it this way. Maybe it doesn't answer your question. I may not have understood it correctly. But I certainly wouldn't include Santa Claus in the major overarching purposes of my life. I'd want some much bigger reason and much bigger thing to commit my life to. And why? It's, what, how you could convince me that... God is bigger than Santa Claus. Well, Santa Claus has never answered any of my prayers, sir. But you're asking me a very personal thing. I've yeah. li I've li well, okay, let's take it personally. In my family life, in my personal life, I have... Now, this is something you can psychologize away in a moment, but I'll say it anyway. At the practical level... 
of discovering the difference God makes in a marriage. God makes in one's relationship with one's children. God makes in guidance in the practicalities of daily, daily life. And sometimes guidance in a way that would appear to me and many other people to be absolutely unmistakable. It's built up a track record in me. Secondly, I read literature about Santa Claus. It doesn't do to me remotely what thinking as hard as I can, and I may not be very gifted at that, but thinking as hard as I can, and taking the Bible seriously, and discovering in it analyses that I find much profounder than in most philosophies, but secondly, sensing that God is speaking through this word and directing life. Now, those are very much at the level of experience, but uh, let me come alongside you for a moment. At the pragmatic level, again and again, my wife and I, and myself independently, have experienced this to such a great deal. And also, final point on this, seeing faith in Christ and God transform people's lives, turning a wrecked marriage and stopping it. Now, I don't say that counselling and other things can't help, but I've seen this kind of thing happen so often yeah. that uh, if you want to use inductive science, the, the case has been proved many, many times over. So, at the practical, pragmatic level, and I don't, I very, I don't remember the last time I talked about this in public because I, I feel, in one sense, it's extremely personal. But you, but you have asked me, and I'm, I'm very happy to say it. But in one sense, it doesn't prove anything intellectually, but boy, does it prove it pragmatically. But, and, okay. no, no, that's, that's okay. Then I still am bothered with the question, you say, that is God what does to me. Yes. Why he doesn't it to me? Well, that's, again, I have spent, all I can say is this, I can only answer that for myself. I can't, I can't know what your dealings of God have been. And it would be um, foolish of me to attempt to discover what your relationship with God is, or was, or, you know, that, that would be very unfair. But you ask me, and I'm saying, in my experience, I have found this. That's as far as I can go. I can't second guess your experience. Only God knows what's in your heart and mind. And I wouldn't attempt to do that because it, it actually would be unfair because I'd probably be wrong. But then I, I think when you say um, I have objective proof of the existence of God, etc., then you cannot say it's only my personal belief. Oh, of course that. Uh, absolutely that. But these, uh, we're, we're talking about two different things. We're talking about experience. If you now go back to the other level, which I'm happy to do, yeah, but the, the I, thing I that validates... From the one to oh, the yes. The, the thing that validates the personal experience, of course, is the fact that I believe there's evidence that God exists. That there's a... You see, let me put it this way, Hans. God is not a theory, he's a person. And that... that that concept means here we are relating as persons. You're not just a theory. No. You are a person. And relating to persons is a much more multi-dimensional thing than relation to theories. There'd be theories about Hans Habers, but it's much more interesting to talk to Hans Habers. I guess but, so. But <laughs> the theories and and the the Objective and subjective, I know you leap down my throat for this because I don't believe there's any purely objective observation. And I've read enough of your subject to, to be very humble about that. Science is done by scientists. But having said all that, I think the corrective, the thing that controls the subjective experience is what I would call the objective evidence. And that comes to me at various levels. And, and one of them is, just to take one at random, is the, the fact we can do science, as I say, the fact that the universe is rationally uh, intelligible. And in the world where I live, and forgive me, uh, that I'm not subtle enough in a way, just, just let me paint it against its opposite, which may not be fair. But when I meet the Dawkins and the Hitchens in this world, they 
have a, 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 an ontological reductive view of the universe that, to my mind, reduces any meaning to meaninglessness. And I, I suspect you agree with that. I'm glad to see that. Yeah. But the, the problem is that to get to that level of meaning, to justify the rational intelligibility, we're back to what happened in the 17th century and God. Now, when I debated the God question at Oxford a year ago, I had one of Oxford's leading professors, an atheist, a philosopher, and he said, I hope you're going to use your best argument. So I was intrigued. I said, what is my best argument? So he said, your best argument is fine-tuning. Now, I think that is an argument that I would bring in. We, science has discovered, this is not ignorance of science, it's knowledge of uh, science, has discovered this universe is a very special place. And it is so special that it has forced cosmologists to ask a very big question. How do you explain it? It just, it, it, it's too startling to not to demand explanation. I mean, my colleague Roger Penrose, says, and he is not a theist, he says um, that if you want a universe with a second law of thermodynamics, the aim of the creator, and those are his words, has to be accurate to 1 power and 10 to the power 10 to the power 123, which as he points out is a number so big, if you put a 1 here and a 0 in every elementary particle in the universe, you couldn't even uh, write it out. So you've got this phenomenal fine tuning and it's interesting to me to see what the physicists are saying, because I'm not one. It's almost as if the universe knew we were coming. Or Paul Davis, the evidence, and he's not a theist either, the evidence of intelligence is overwhelming. Those to me are pointers towards mm -hmm. God. They're not proofs, because we okay. both know you can't get proofs in the mathematical sense of anything except the mathematics. But they are pointers. And I would go yeah. on and on. But, but I'm not, because you're quizzing yes. me and not me you. <laughs> but back to the point of uh, materialism and uh, lack of meaning. Yes. Uh, and then immediately you say, uh, uh, I, I fully agree with that, with that critique on materialism. And, and, but for the notion of meaning, I need you and you and you, and, but not a god. Uh, meaning is what... It, it, it reminds me of a, a nice article of, of Richard Rorty. He said, uh, it's about solidarity and objectivity. He said, we can legitimize our actions in, uh, fundamentally in two ways. One is the materialist ones uh, referring to an external reality. This is the case, these are the laws of nature, so it's nature, so thus we have to act in this and this way. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the interhuman solidarity. We act in this way because we, in our tradition, in our culture, with our meanings, do it in this way. And he opposed uh, the objectivist. He said, object objectivism is in the end a form of solidarity. But th then you have a notion of meaning based on solidarity, on shared meaning, of shared cultural traditions. There, I don't need a transcendental point at all. I need my history. I, I, and my history and my connections, which are going for centuries, are enough. I don't need a transcendental point, not a God, not a nature outside. It's imminent. It's within my connection, historical, cultural world, we create meaning. My response to that is, you also need a universe. You also? Need a universe. Uh, you're starting assuming that all these things exist in the universe. If you ask the next question, the next level up, I don't think you get a universe. And this will bring us into cosmology, unfortunately. But I don't think you get a universe without a transcendent God. You see, the interesting thing is this. I think we can think that we can create meaning. Because you and I, from where I sit, and forgive me if I, I say this, you and I and everybody in this room are, whether we believe in God or not, creatures made in the image of God. And therefore we have the innate capacity of creating meaning. But it's because we are related to an infinite God. 
And that's at the back of it. You say you've got solidarity. That means you've got a whole lot of human beings. But where did they come from ultimately? And their brains. You've got a universe. You've got matter. Where did all that come uh, from? The point being that cosmology has finally caught up with the Bible. Because the Bible has said for centuries that there was a beginning. In the 1960s, when I started Cambridge, they didn't believe there was a beginning. And then they came to believe that there was a beginning and the evidence for the hot big bang came in and they, irony, you probably remember this, perhaps you're younger than me. Um, in the 1960s, when the evidence for the beginning came in, it was fiercely resisted in England. I don't know if that happened in the Netherlands, but it was ironic looking back. The editor of Nature wrote in Nature a lead article saying we must not give in to this new idea that there was a beginning. Why? because it'll give too much leverage to people who believe the Bible. Now, that will start me, and we'd need an evening for it, but the brief situation is this. Contemporary cosmology has got into a very interesting pickle and difficulty, because it's come to the idea that the universe started with nothing, and science doesn't like the idea of nothing, as you see from the way in which they try to redefine it, because if space, time, and matter came into existence, the natural question to ask is the question of causation. And if it's not space, time, matter, it is highly likely to be mind. I think we have a rather uh, different philosophical starting position. So. I, uh, I've detected that all in, the way through. In, in the sense that you define a, a universe, and fr first you have a universe, and then you have particles in the universe. No, no, no. I, ju I just... First I have God. You see... Yes, am God I, is your I, universe. Am I I, no, no, he's not. Am I putting this right? It seems to me the difference between us is this. I start with God. In the beginning was the word. That is meaning, logic, logos, everything that that means. And mass energy is derivative. Am I right in suggesting that you start the other way around? Mass energy is primary and everything else is derivative. No, there's nothing primary. Oh. There is a, a network of going on. But there's no ultimate reality in your view, is there? What would you conceive ultimate reality no, to be? No, the, the, the notion of ultimate reality is, a, in my philosophy, a superfluous terminology. I must read some of your philosophy. Forgive me if I haven't this read is, it yet. Let me say it in this way. This comes from Sartre. Sartre makes the existence between essence and existence. The essence of something and the existence of something. Yes. Within your worldview, and it is not only your worldview, but also uh, the materialistic worldview, all the worldviews who take a kind of transcendentalism, they say we have first an essence, and then an existence. We should know what it is to be, uh, let us take the gender question, to be a man or a woman, and then we can talk about what a man and a woman in a, in a yeah. concrete situation. We first have to define an essence. This is Platonism. Plato is an essentialist. And then we, have the, then we can see what the existence is. Sartre turned it around. And, I don't like Sartre on all kinds of aspects, well, but this aspect I do. He was a hard atheist, of the, course. The, the, the essence of something so I'm glad is, you don't like is the result <laughs> of existence. What is the result of practices? Well, the result of what we are doing, connecting, etc. Let me give one example. The universal human rights. Universal human rights. They are not universal because there is some moral point beyond the human beings from which we can deduce that there are universal human rights. Human rights are the more universal, the more countries sign the treatment of the universal rights. It's the product of our action, not the condition for our action. So you disagree with Jürgen Habermas on this, because uh, Jürgen Habermas is one of the leading atheists in Europe, but I was very interested to see when he was talking about human rights, he said, you know, 
when we look at human rights, where do they come from? He said all of them in our legal system, our education systems, um, this university like mine, at least yours, used to have a Christian motto, the Lord is my light or something like that. Um, the Christian Foundation of Education, the legal system and so on. Jürgen Habermas writing in his book Übergänge says a very interesting thing. Mm -hmm. He says the only source we've got for them is the Judeo-Christian ethic. And then he adds everything else is idle postmodern chatter. So you would disagree with that. But this is a historical argument. This, this is the same as the no, Weber, Weber argument again, that indeed in that time uh, uh, Christian thinking was functional for all kind of... But this isn't Christian thinking. This goes way beyond Christianity. This is page one of Genesis. God made human beings in his image. But, now, but that let's put it this ha way. Habermas didn't say that. No, no, he didn't. But he said that it's that ethic that's behind our human rights. Let me put it this way, Hans. I mean, I've said this often in Russia, and it's been very interesting the reaction to it. You know, I once took the risk, and this was 89 in Siberia, and I wanted to get home from Siberia. Um, I said to a group, I said, look, take this single statement of the Bible. God made man in his own image. And I suddenly stopped and I said, you know, if I really believed that, I would be very careful how I treated one of you. I wouldn't murder one of you, let alone a hundred million of you as Stalin did. And the reaction was utterly overwhelming. And it's very interesting. Many of my Russian friends, and I love your comment on this, because I spent a lot of time there, because I've been very interested in what goes on. But on this subject, I've had a number of them all over Russia in the Academy of Science say to me, look, John, we thought we could get rid of God and retain a value for human beings, and we discovered far too late we couldn't. And Solzhenitsyn, as you know, when he was asked, what do you put down the slaughter of 70 or 100 million of your nation? He said, in a word, we have forgotten God. So that's where I'm coming from, that this overarching principle lies behind your human rights. Now, I agree with you that it's very important for various nations to sign up to it. But the power of it will be because whether we believe in God or not, we have been created by him as moral beings and therefore we have a moral sense. That's why you find, as you know, look around all the philosophies, religions, non-religions, anything around the world, you'll find in every one of them explicitly stated the golden rule. You'll find a common pool of morality. Now from where I sit, that's another powerful evidence of the existence of a unifying God. So it, 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 it comes in, it doesn't dispute what you're saying. It's wonderful when people sign up to it. But I think if there's going to be any power to it, it's because it appeals to something innate and creatorial within us. My pragmatic answer to this would be that... Well, it wasn't a question, it was a statement. <laughs> <laughs> but even a statement can be countered by an answer. Yes, 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 okay. Uh, <laughs> That this, that this is not, for you this is a, a, a kind of proof, or maybe the, the word proof is not a good, for the existence of God. I would no, say... No, it's powerful evidence. Powerful evidence. I'm a mathematician, I, I don't use the word proof. This is, for me, in my pragmatic tradition, this, this idea of solidarity, that meaning is in our culture and history, uh, for me it is, is this powerful evidence of the functionality of an illusion. <laughs> it could be evidence for the truth of what you think to be an illusion. <laughs> yeah, and that's our, maybe our difference, and I think we will never come together here. No, well that's the value of doing the discussion, because uh, yeah. we're sitting in front of highly intelligent people, and the wonderful thing about this evening is we're presenting different cases it, and it's up yeah. to them to choose. Th th then I have... It. And then we go to the questions. A, a oh. last question. A, We're supposed, mm -hmm. You say this is the nice thing of having discussions. Yes. Uh, I fully agree with that. For me, having discussions and exchange 
different ideas of meaning is the most important thing. More important than a fundamental, uh, non-discussable meta-narrative. Or in other words... Well, who suggested it was non-discussable? De democracy is, for me, a higher value than truth. And for you? Well, I would say, how many wings does an eagle need to fly? Was that an answer on my question? <laughs> yes. I, I think you know, I, I wouldn't rank them. But if I were, were to rank them, I, I would put truth, of course, as the highest value. It's not for nothing. I think the central claim, the startling claim that Jesus made, which I've thought about a lot, I am the truth. If he'd simply said, I speak the truth, we mightn't have noticed so much. But to say, I am the truth, and claiming simultaneously that he was God incarnate, I think that puts truth in a very special place. And is this a scientific truth or a religious revelation truth? Well, it's both actually, because uh, it's certainly a truth of revelation, he claims it. But then the evidence can be approached scientifically in the German sense of Wissenschaft as distinct from biology or meteorology. In other words, it's rational truth. I do not accept the, and I'm sure you don't, because you're a philosopher, that this idea of scientism, that the only way to truth is scientific, that's nonsense. If it closed down half of this university overnight. Yeah. Or that science is coextensive with rationality, which is a very dangerous offshoot of scientism. So when I approach the, the question of Jesus, the evidence for his life, death, and resurrection, there are two sides to it. There is, of course, I take revelation seriously, but I don't regard it as opposed to reason. I regard it as another source of information on which we use reason. It's the two books that you referred to at the beginning. Roger Bacon, the book of God's world and the book of his word. Yeah. So it's coming out of both sides. So it, is, it involves revelation, but it doesn't involve irrationality. Okay, we have to stop here since there are a lot of questions. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we have two sources for uh, questions. That is you in the room, and that is the Twitter or Twitter account. Are there questions already? What, what do you want? Uh, uh, one by one, or well, let's hear a few of the questions. Why don't we hear a few of them? Because. It's up to you, but if you want to read out a few of them, you that have a few relevant. questions. Yes, I've got a few questions. Okay. And you, you make notes, and I make notes, no, and then yes. we can see what. Okay, fire away. Yes, there's first a few questions to you, Mr. Lennox. Um, do you believe that God is the highest purpose for every human being, even for those who don't know Him? Okay. Next. <laughs> Does God signify to you the same as it did to Spinoza? Sorry? Does God signify to you the same as it did to Spinoza? Spinoza's God, okay. <laughs> Let's hear another one. Uh, that one. It's always very interesting for everybody to hear a few of them, just to know what's in the spectrum of your questionings. Yep. Yeah? The third one is not as much a question as uh, a saying we got, that was about fine-tuning. Mm -hmm. It said, fine-tuning is equivalent to a bottle of water, thinking it's in a special place because the hole fits its shape perfectly. Thinking it's a special... Uh, thinking it is in a special place because the hole fits its shape perfectly. I can't hear that word because... You mean the water is shaped by the bottle? Yes. It oh, is. I see. Yeah. Okay. That's a nice idea. <laughs> okay, number four. Yeah, there's actually a question to Mr. Harbus as well. Oh, wonderful. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it's only one. Uh, what is your purpose in life in one sentence? And is it the same for every human being? Are you going to read us a couple more, and then we'll say, and then we can take some more? 
Uh, one for you again. What is your reaction to the fact educated Western world going away from religion and poor countries people coming to religions? Okay. Is that enough answer? Yeah. For now, I think there will be. Or have you a wrong. very urgent one that you want to put in there so as we can all be thinking about it? Have you another urgent one? No. Okay. Go ahead. Do you want to take yours first? No, I can think about a while. You go first. <laughs> um, do you believe God's the highest purpose for every human being? Well, I started by saying purpose is a personal and subjective thing, and clearly that is not the case. So the answer is no. But I think behind the question lies something else, possibly. And uh, it's part of the reason why I'm here. Because believing what I do it has certain corollaries. I want to share it with other people. And, and so, and I admit that quite openly. That is, I want to expose them to these ideas in the hope that something makes sense and, and clicks with them. And perhaps, who knows, opens their mind to a, a bigger and a wider horizon. I've seen it happen so many times that I think it's worth sharing our purposes and, and the results. So that's, that's, that's what I'd say about that. The um, um, fine tuning in the bottle of water, just to come to that, I, I think that misunderstands fine tuning completely. The water is shaped to the bottle because the bottle is a constraint. The point about fine tuning is it would appear, so the cosmologists tell me, that these constants and these ratios could be, in one sense, arbitrary anything, but the fact is they are exactly right to produce uh, life. Now, I know the bottle has a corollary argument, uh, and John Leslie, who you will know, the philosopher, uh, has answered it. And I would put it a different way if I was wanting to put that objection. And I'd, I'd say this, let me come over in that person's question or side. I'd say, look here, um, why are you surprised that the universe is fine-tuned? After all, by definition, you couldn't find yourself in any other kind of universe. Because you're here. So, why is it a surprise? Well, it's a bit like if I issued every one of you with an AK-47 rifle. This is Leslie's analogy. And you were all a firing squad, which you may want to be after this evening. You were all a firing squad, you aimed your guns at me, and somebody in the audience said, well, you shouldn't be surprised to find yourself alive after the old shot. After all, that's the only situation you could find yourself in. I would say I would jolly well want, be very surprised. I'd want to know why the old mist was a deliberate design. So I think actually, although it's a clever point that doesn't really address what fine uh, tuning is. Two more things. Spinoza's God and the God of the scientists and the God of the philosophers. I, I think... Uh, and this, uh, if you look at the web later, you'll see we had a bit of a discussion in um, Delft last night about this question. Looking at the universe, I've said tonight, I believe I can understand something of God, but it's actually quite limited. You'll, if you just stop there, you'll say, well, this looks lovely, there's some distant God that designed the universe and so on. And you're very rapidly with... with the god of Einstein or Spinoza, the god of the philosophers. But no, I believe much more that God is a supernatural god who created and upholds the universe and who highly specifically has encoded himself in humanity and come into our world in Jesus Christ and has given evidence of it. So my belief, Richard Dawkins in his book, The God Delusion, says, I'm against all supernatural gods. That's why he's against me. So, um, final question, and then I'll give it to you. Uh, the Western world running away from religion and poor countries returning to religion. There's a very interesting book written by the Washington and the London editors of um, uh, Time magazine or Newsweek. No, The Economist. They're, neither of them is a Christian. And what they're writing about, the title of the book, uh, in answer to your question, is God is back. He's talking about the Western world. And he's talking about the increase in interest in God 
uh, uh, particularly among young people and students. Look at the crowd here tonight. What is that telling me? I've been going around the world for the last four years. The, the crowds of people interested in God are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I'm not so much in despair. Now, of course, I believe that outside the Western world, there are other, if you like, worlds which have not had the influence of um, secularism or atheism or the strident voices of the new atheists to the extent that we have had on the one hand, and on the second uh, and on the other hand, they have lived much further nearer to the poverty line than we have. And what is very interesting to my mind is this, that being much poorer has not driven them away from God. Many people in the Western world look at that from a distance and they say, well, I couldn't believe in God who allows that to happen. And yet the people to whom it's happening are turning to God in droves. I think that's worth thinking about. So I'm not sure that I accept the proposition, but I'm not a universal statistician. I never liked statistics, so I'm very risk it's a very risky thing to base things on them. So back to you, Hans. Have you got your question there? Uh, purpose in life. What was my purpose in life? Uh, the first thing I would say, I don't have one purpose in life, but many. Yes. Uh, why to talk about one overarching mm. purpose of life? There are, it's a good thing to do good science. It's a good thing to, good, to have good laws. Uh, there, it's a good thing to have a nice democracy in, in order we can uh, have a good discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's a good thing to have good love, to good sex, to good drinks, good rock and roll. It's all purposes of life. Very different purposes of life. Uh, and this is not higher or lower. No, they are all connected and there is not an overarching purpose of life. Maybe if I want to answer the question, maybe if there is an overarching purpose of life, I would formulate it earlier, in, preferably in a negative than in a positive sense. Mm -hmm. uh, a kind of Karl Popper idea of avoiding suffering, avoiding pain. But that's something different as formulating a positive purpose of life. Mm -hmm. Since the soon we formulate a one overarching positive purpose of life, see the political history, and not only Northern Ireland, but also what uh, 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 Stalin did, what Hitler did. These were all overarching purposes of life formulating yes, and it are. is incredible incredible dangerous to do that be more modest be more modest and don't formulate these kind of overarching fundamental ever holding purposes of life this uh -huh. is the baddest thing we can do this will lead to war um, can I say something about that go ahead we got back to Northern Ireland, you see. I take you very seriously, Hans, on this point. And there's a, a very big sense in which I agree with you. Uh, the hard problem, I think, for me is this problem of suffering and evil. It's a hard problem for all of us. But I do notice, though, that things need to be said about some, uh, differentiating some of those issues. Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens, um, was a war correspondent, saw a lot of religious fighting and so on. And I remember chatting to him and I said, Christopher, you know, there's something about you I do not understand. And I'm sure if he was alive today, he wouldn't mind me saying this. And he said, what's that? I said, why you're not on the side of Christ but fighting against them? And he said, what do you mean by that? Well, I said, your criticisms of religious violence and everything else are the very thing that put Jesus on trial. Historically, he was tried for stirring up political violence. Now, the very interesting thing to my mind, very important thing historically, that Christ was cleared of the charge and that means that people who take up weapons, as in my country, and I'm coming back in a circle, take up weapons uh, to defend Christ's message, they're not following him, they're disobeying him. 
He said very clearly, in the public court of this world, in front of Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, my servants would have been fighting, so that I should not have been delivered to the authorities. And then he said to Pilate, to this end I was born, and to this end I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Upon which Pilate said, what is truth? And went out to the crowd and said, he's innocent. Because Pilate could see, that the one thing you cannot do with truth is impose it by violence. So, what I'm saying is this, that if you're going to, and I, you know, when people ask me about Northern Ireland hands, my first thing normally to say is I'm utterly ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. Utterly ashamed of it. That the name of Christ, but I need to explain that, that the name of Christ was ever associated with violence because he himself explicitly forbade it. So that's the one side. But on the other side, I do notice that the ideologies you mentioned, Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao. I read Dawkins' book and he, he sings John Lennon's song, you know, imagine a world without the Taliban, without all these fundamentalists you talk about. Even without Northern Ireland, he says, although how anybody could imagine a world without Northern Ireland, I just <laughs> don't know. But you see, I'm not John Lennon, I'm John Lennox. And I've written a song called Imagine. Mm, yes, I have. I'm not going to sing it to you, but I've written it. Imagine a world without Stalin. Imagine a world without Mao and Pol Pot. What about that world? The new atheists, I'm not talking about you, Hans. The new atheists are silent about that. Mm -hmm. And that worries me because that's a revisionist attitude to history. Dawkins writes, I cannot imagine an atheist who would bulldoze a cathedral. And Richard Schroeder beautifully writes, and he says, you're dead right. Cathedrals are too big for bulldozers. <laughs> Stalin and Ulbricht used dynamite. Now, when I read that out at the Polish Academy of Sciences, they stopped me. They said, stop, when I said this about you can't imagine an atheist. They said, send them over to us. And I've been to so many holes in the ground where churches have been blown up that have lost counting. What I think is very unfair in the debate, and I'm speaking broadly, I'm not, I'm not speaking to Hans at all, is that we have a very dangerous attitude to history. Blame everything on God, but inaccurately, and blame nothing on atheism. I want to be fairer than that, and I'm sure you do. But now my final point here. This purpose, Hans, which I, I admire, reacting against the evils of Hitler fundamentalism of any kind. I react with you, but I have a, a concern for justice, as I know you have. Mm -hmm. And one of my major reasons for being a Christian is that if there is no God, and there's no final judgment of humanity, and there's no life after death, then all the terrorists have by definition got away with it. Hitler reigns kills ever so many million people of different kinds and then he just blows himself up. If he never faces ultimate justice, then justice ends up being an illusion. And that's one of the biggest things. We haven't, we're just now mentioning it towards the end, but I think it's vastly important that the resurrection of Jesus Christ means for me that he is going to be the world's final judge. And so I have a hope not only of having justice in this life and would want to struggle for it as you do and see it carried out, but I believe that there's going to be an ultimate justice and that's the one that validates all the things down here on earth. Now, would it be right in assuming that that ultimate thing is something that for you is shut off by definition by death because there's no survival? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't... I, I don't argue in terms of, uh, of ultimates. Yeah, but you believe that's the end. So there'll never be any justice ultimately. Justice is always redefined again. That is not so. Again, think, justice think, is, is, is what is the existence and not the essence. But I you think, are again searching for an essence. I'm not searching for anything. I'm asking a question. I'm asking if you think that there will be justice after death or not. In other words, do you believe that physical death is the end of existence? I hope in living my life 
with all those different purposes and all the others with all their different purposes. Maybe we could create in a world where there is a lit, little bit less injustice. Well, of course we could, but that doesn't answer my question. But and I applaud you for doing it. But that's all I have. That's all you have. Yeah. That's all you and that's have. not a positive definition of justice. No. That's okay. a negative... Uh, uh, to avoid the danger of the positive formulations. Okay. But they, 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 may I ask you on your question? Uh, you, I th we fully agree that you say uh, that, that uh, scientific belief is in, in, in that sense dangerous. Oh, you, you some, said, you said no, that. no, not all scientific belief. No, but the materialist... You, oh, I, I you do. Attacked. And yes, I, I fully agree with that. Yes. And I think, for example, oh, he's gone. Uh, Bruno Latour is one of the authors who exactly attacked this idea of a kind of scientific fundamentalism. Yes, scientism. Yeah. So I like you yeah. calling it scientific fundamentalism. I thought I'd invented that phrase. So it's lovely to hear somebody else uh, using it. I sometimes call it uh, uh, the believers in disbelief. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's scientific fundamentalist, but and I know within science, that's that's my business for the philosophy of science, how to attack that that within the sci within oh, science. Oh sure, so do I. How how do you? What are in your Christian worldview the internal mechanisms to avoid the misuse? Oh, of God. That's a very good question. Not, not in my terminology, no, no, but in no, your no, own? No, absolutely. And I've grown up in a country where God was misused a lot. Yeah. And I, 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 I take that question full on. Well, what I've tried to do, pragmatically, is to constantly question myself. I'm a great Socratic about myself. I spent my entire life exposing my views to other views and taking them as seriously as I possibly can. I don't want to be mistaken. I don't want to be guilty of fundamentalist intransigent attitudes that are potentially dangerous because I see that all around the place. And my only known way of doing it is by allowing myself to be corrected by constant intelligent discourse like what we've been having tonight. And I think it's so important for, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, sorry, I'll start to preach like an old man, but uh, <laughs> forgive me, ladies and gentlemen. But, you know, learning to be Socrates is such an important thing, wouldn't you agree with me? Yeah. That learning to ask questions, in fact, I have a little rule. When I meet somebody new, I keep asking them questions until they ask me one. Sometimes they never do, but that's boring. Uh, <laughs> But it's so interesting as a way of getting to know people and their worldviews. And I spent my life doing it. And so my Christian faith has been built up not by drawing up the castle walls and closing myself in and uh, priming the cannons and getting the AK-47s ready. It's by exposing all my beliefs and my arguments to a very broad spectrum of alternative opinion. And what that has done, it's made me more humble, I hope, in many areas, because I've been corrected many times, but it has also confirmed my faith in the reality of God a thousand times over. So, that's my, my response to it. But I think on, on a lot of points now we agree on this Socrates idea of... But for me, that is, uh, I think, one of the most difficult things is to live in an uncertain world. And to Absolutely. acknowledge the uncertainty. Uncertainty on religious level, on scientific level, on whatever level. Accepting the uncertainty. Oh, we accept it, but it's good to att attempt to diminish some of it. For some time, a little minute. Well, let me put it to you. I've been married for, what, 46 years? I don't know everything about my wife. You're happy. But I wouldn't like to live with constant uncertainty of whether she loved me or not. 
Uh, and I think in relationships again, you see, we live in a dynamic of uncertainty about many things, about disease, about what's going to happen when we go out of the door tonight. But there are anchor points, I think, in life where we can diminish the uncertainty. And what I feel that faith is, it's a dynamic process of commitment based on evidence that grows. And therefore, if you like to put it that way, my uncertainties about God have been reduced over the years. Just as any uncertainty, my friends, you know, you meet somebody and sometimes you a bit doubt about this and then, but suddenly friendship grows and it diminishes the uncertainty. That is what I would expect in a human relationship. The trouble is, when we use the phrase, we live in an uncertain world, we can be talking at a hundred levels at once. And there are many levels where it is uncertain. There might be tectonic plates immediately beneath this floor. Uh, or there might be an old mine shaft, the whole thing could collapse in a couple of minutes, and so on. We live with all those kinds of uncertainties. I don't know whether the plane that's taking me home to L London tomorrow will take me home. There is risk, but it seems to me that we navigate risk by increasing where we can certainties in other directions. And the things that help us navigate life and navigate purpose are relationships human relationships, and of course I believe the one, dare I use the word again, overarching relationship with God. May I have one last point maybe about uh, your loving wife. Uh, since love talk is very interesting here, uh, you say I hope uh, I want to be a bit certain about uh, her. Uh, Not uh, a bit certain, I want to be very certain. You want to be very certain. <laughs> I but, am very certain. But still, she has to reproduce it now and then. I think... Reproduce what? Her love for you. Oh, uh, for yes, I see. I think you mean reciprocate. <laughs> for, ex for example, when, ah. she, when she comes to you next Sunday and say, John, I love you very much, then your answer, I think, will not be yes. I know for certain since you said that 47 years ago when you will be married. Absolutely not. You're right. And what's the point you're making about that? I'll remember it, of course, when I meet her on Sunday. But that, uh, what's the point you're making? That we have to make it certain again and again. Oh, yes. Relationships are dynamic. Of course we do. And we'll go through existential situations where we may go into a trough and so on. That's absolutely right, but I agree with that. And that's the same with Santa Claus. So we make oh. every time Santa Claus again. Is there a department of faith in Santa Claus at this university? He's been, <laughs> he's, he's been mentioned so often, I'm beginning to think he's more real than I believed when I came into the room. Yes, yes. <laughs> you thought it was fiction. For me, it's reality. I heard from the organization that we had to stop. But you want to stop or another yeah. round of questions or I think what do you want? Well, I think we should stop. Mm. They want to stop. Okay, we stop. Uh, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, John. <laughs> thank you very much.